Hi there, I'm Anne Marie McQueen, editor of Live Healthy, and this is the Live Healthy Podcast. Each week we interview health and wellness leaders and talk about all the things that are good for you, which you can also read about in our online magazine, the only one of its kind for men and women in the UAE. And now, here's this week's guest. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi, good. thank you very much. I'm very excited to speak with you today because we're talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is behavior change. And you have two decades plus experience in this area in the UK. Can you sort of, in the UK where you talk, you headed up one of the first major public health behavior change programs. Can you just talk about behavior change in the macro, sort of what that means when you're, when you're, career is devoted to it? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I suppose I came to behaviour change through almost kind of a clinical background because I worked a lot in the Department of Health on in the UK around um, these big national clinical strategies. Um, and I, I kind of found that what we were doing in the UK and what we're still doing in a large part of the world is that we're fixing people, um, whereas what we should really be doing is actually helping them to live healthier lives. So, for example, COPD programs, heart disease programs, all of the things that cause ill health are usually lifestyle type issues that people, for whatever reason, um, effectively don't live the healthiest lifestyle. Uh, and affects, you know, it is about really looking at the reasons why people live those unhealthy lifestyles and actually helping them and supporting them and providing them with information on how to lead a more healthy lifestyle. And I guess that, I believe, will have more impact in the future than just providing more hospitals or providing more uh, drugs, et cetera, that in fact will probably get more benefit from just those behaviour change programmes than we will from just increasing the amount of, of kind of drugs, the amount of interventions. And I think before I even kind of start is that behavior change, we can't force people to change their behaviors. Um, and I think that's the one thing that I just want to kind of get clear before we start, unless, you know, you want to send people to prison, then that, you know, you can do that. You can, you know, you can actually do that. And we've done it with smoking cessation. We can make it illegal to smoke in certain places. Most of the behaviour change that works is about getting people to decide for them to kind of really think about what they want out of their lives and then to make the change based on our help and support, but not our enforcement. And I think the one thing that I would say about behaviour change as well is that a lot of people think education is enough. And, you know, if you ask most people in most kind of countries and let's say, well, you know, how do you eat healthily? Well, lots of fruit and veg. And then you ask them, well, do you do that? And they sort of say, well, no, not really. Um, and it is difficult to have that kind of healthy lifestyle. So I think we have to, one, acknowledge that and two, then support, start from that kind of support mechanism. So that's where I came to behaviour change. Um, and that's where I'm hoping that this programme um, in Abu Dhabi will have that same impact. We know that we do have problems here around um, type 2 diabetes, smoking, cancer rates, and, you know, everybody knows kind of that there's some genetics around those diseases, but everybody also knows um, that it is about lifestyle um, and, and, you know, how you live your life um, really does impact on, on, on kind of on, on, on your life uh, and your life expectancy and your healthy living years. So first of all, we're asking people to do two things that we don't do very often, which is think about the long term over the short term, something it's very hard to conceive of 30 years, 10 years, 20 years down the road versus what's happening right now. And then I know, you know, in my own life, the changes I've made, I didn't get here at 52 where I eat pretty healthy and I move because I know it makes me feel good now and it's good for later. 
if you, that takes, that took years for me to get to, you know what I mean? It took years for me. And so when you're sitting and you don't have very many of those habits, it does seem insurmountable. So that's where I'm curious about just sort of the science and practice of it to, to overcome those two major hurdles of this is going to be such a big job. I'd rather just not bother right now. I can't face it. And I can't envision the future far enough ahead to see a healthier me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's exactly that. And I think, you know, there are mechanisms to do that. And I think I always remember speaking to my son about, you know, not smoking. And I sort of said, you know, you're going to feel really healthy in sort of 20, 30 years. He's, he didn't really care what he was doing in the afternoon, you know. So I think you're right. But I think the way that we kind of treat this really difficult issue around kind of long-term benefits against, you know, very short-term gain. And who wouldn't want a piece of cake um, if somebody brings it into the office? You don't think about what impact that's going to have in later life. But I think what we try and do in behavior change is look at from look at the issues from the perspective of the people that we are trying to help. Think about the barriers that they're facing and they may be real barriers so it may be kind of you know the opportunity they don't have access to you know really good food or opportunities to go um, and actually uh, exercise but it might be perceived barriers as well um, and it might be things like you know I don't believe I can exercise or my condition makes it so I can't exercise and then what we do is to try and think well how can we overcome those barriers and put things into small, manageable, bite-sized pieces and try and give, I guess, that kind of kind of potential benefits immediately that, you know, okay, so, you know, you're not going to feel the benefits of maybe taking, you know, 100 extra steps every day. But soon you can actually see some benefit from that kind of very slow process. And I think, I don't know, we've taken quite a lot from kind of mindfulness, but that pacing, that kind of increasing your kind of exercise, knowing that effectively we will all fail, but that doesn't mean to say that you're going to keep on failing. So example, a really good example is smoking cessation. Most people um, actually get rid of smoking and the habit of smoking after maybe two or three three habits, three, sorry, three times mm-hmm. to try. Mm-hmm. So what we, we do in smoking cessation is say, look, we're not going to say you're going to fail, but it's okay if you do because you can try again. And I think that's the process. And I think when we look about, when we look at kind of behaviour change, one, we're always looking from the perspective of the people that we're trying to help. So we're not kind of saying you know, really, you should be eating this and you should be doing more exercise. We all know that. But we actually think about, well, what what can we do to make it easy? And, you know, for an example, you know, we've got some of our messaging in AD 360 is, you know, walk to the mosque. Uh, if you can, park your car when you go to the mall at the opposite side. So you've got a little bit more of a walk. And, you know, those are the things that, you know, make that change. And we have, um, we're developing a, a kind of an app, which is, you know, there are loads of apps out there, but our app takes a very kind of slow but sure change in terms of lifestyle. So we've got a kind of what we call our slow lane, our foundation lane, which starts with people stretching. So there are some people who find it really difficult to even stretch and find a lot of pain from stretching. Mm-hmm. But over that period, and when you've done what kind of pain management courses or you've looked at that, that it's not that painful now. And if you then get them to do seated exercise um, and then start thinking about doing kind of exercise um, with stretching and then cool down and then 10 minutes in the middle. So it's that slow progression that's really important when you're thinking about these programs. But most of all, it's about putting yourself in the shoes of the people you're trying to help. I'm thinking about when I was working at the National, we teamed up with a local CrossFit gym to do this health program. There were 15 of us. Well, 15, most journalists who just sat all day and probably smoked and ate terrible food. A few of us were active. And I mean, you know, I think half the group was out with injury. I mean, it went from people sitting all day to five days a week of uh, a CrossFit classes. I could barely walk. Like I was in so much pain from the 
the, just the exercises. And then no wonder like six or seven people that hurt their back, their knee, because they, it's basically like you're sitting. And I just yeah. thought this is all wrong. Like, I just feel terrible the way that we've partnered with this organization that we've done it this way. This isn't helping the public, like having, no. you know, this is not how you do it. And that's how that gym did it. You walk in that gym and no matter what size you are, they tell you to do five hours a day of high intensity exercise and weights. And it's like, what do you, this is a very common thing. This is a very common yeah. thing in gyms. Like how, what's, how are you guys sort of dealing with that? Well, I, mean, I think what, what we're hoping to do and I'm hoping that you will be able to help us in this is that, you know, it, it's about trusted information um, and knowing that, you know, effectively there are going to be times where, people go to gyms and they're going to be given the wrong advice. But I think it's about educating the public so that they know that that isn't what they should be doing. I mean, that is really harmful. And in fact, actually, it can cause so much more harm, not only in the short term in terms of, you know, injuries. But the fact is that when the next time people will think about exercise, they may not do it. And, and, you know, that that is potentially, you know, more damaging than actually just sitting down and doing nothing. So I think it is about that educating, which is important. We need to kind of educate people. We need to give them the opportunities. So the gyms are great, but we need to, that kind of, that, that sort of information that's provided by government and by reputable organisations that says, you know, if you've not exercised for, you know, two or three years, if you're basically sedentary, you need to start at a foundation level through stretching, through seated exercise. And once you've done that, you'll gradually feel kind of a lot better. Um, and I think, you know, when we've worked with people with chronic conditions, it is amazing um, what can be done. So I was visiting um, a, a class that was aimed at people with Parkinson's. Um, and people had gone to this class. There's about 30, 40 people um, for the last seven years. Most of them have been going for the last seven years. And we've been looking at, you know, what has been the impact of them doing this kind of class, which is, you know, you go to it and think, oh, that's actually, are they actually moving? Or, is, you know, are people actually doing exercise? They are. And what they've done is over those last those sort of five years that we've been looking at them, is that their cognitive abilities and their kind of strength hasn't reduced. So this is people, these are people with conditions that would expect normally to have you know, deteriorated, but they've actually potential, well, they've, they've, they've actually had the potential to keep on going, exercise, mm -hmm. working in the community setting, all of that has helped them maintain their, you know, their, their, their kind of their, their fitness levels and their ability to, to kind of work. So it is really important that whenever we are developing these programs, we develop them very, very carefully, but also for not a one size fits all. So when people, you mentioned the gym, there'll be young people who'll go into that gym and quite easily do that, that kind of CrossFit, you know, do five hours and, you know, become super fit. But we know from public health within the Abu Dhabi Public Health Center and the Abu Dhabi um, sports council that we know that all people aren't like that and there'll be people who will find the challenge of you know just walking to the mosque or walking along um, the promenade or through you know the parks they, they'll find that as challenging and but we have to reward those people for doing that mm -hmm. in the same way and I suppose we're going right the way back to our first you know discussion point which is how do you how do you kind of reward people for actually doing things that we want them to do? And you can sort of say, well, you know, the rewards are for an older person. You may see you may see your granddaughter being married. You may be able to walk them down, down the aisle. Um, you know, for older people, just playing with their grandchildren on the floor is actually a huge potential benefit. And you'll see that um, a, a lot of older people can maintain that flexibility um, through through yoga, but just through basically keeping active, walking a little bit, and that keeps them supple as well and their muscles working. And that old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that, that's the key thing is that 
you know, just keeping going um, is really important, but doing it in a kind of a sustainable and kind of uh, a, a way that is not, you know, really pushing. I mean, we all want to kind of push ourselves a little bit, but it's knowing what our, our, our limits are, and that's really important. You said something really beautiful in there about people with chronic diseases and and sort of altering their outcomes. And it 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 reminded me that I think a lot of times people think their diagnosis and the prognosis is definite. And mm. I think also if someone was ill and they heard of a program like this, it's like that's for healthy people to prevent getting ill. But I think engaging everyone, like people with conditions now, and then sort of halting the the flow of the the way what they think they are what they've been told will happen to them changing your mm. mind about it like that's a huge audience as well right like that's a huge group of people yeah i mean i, I mean I, i've done quite a lot of work on how mris are communicated to patients so if you have an mri and this is why i think it can be quite detrimental to have an mri or to have is that you'll probably get a physician who, you know, will look and say, well, you've got quite substantial problems here in your back and, you know, some of your kind of your back is a little bit out and you've got denigration of your discs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that probably for a 50-year-old, but everybody's got that, you know. And I've seen, you know, I, I, when I do conferences, I sometimes put these two MRIs up in front and I say, right, tell me who is the marathon runner? And who mm. is the person who is in a wheelchair? And they always choose the wrong person. They, you know, so effectively, you know, I've seen MRIs of people who you think, how, how did they do it? How can they get up? They must, but it's it's about how your your kind of mind works and also about how you react. So a lot of people will go to an, an MRI and they'll say, you know, the physician will say, well, it's all wear and tear. And that immediately puts into your brain, well, actually, if I do more, that's going to put more wear and tear. So if I've got a problem with my knee, and I have a problem with my knee, I'm in my late 50s, um, that means that I better not do as much walking as I used to do because it will wear and tear it. But it's the absolute opposite, that the more you do, the more muscle that you will actually build up around your knee and the more that your, your knee will get used to actually being used and worked. So, in fact, it's actually the complete opposite of, you know, where people often think they are. Um, and often they are kind of taken down a clinical role where, a, a, a role where, People are having kind of new knees and new kind of hips. And of course, there is a need for that, people in really bad pain. But that, I would say a lot of people who have these, you know, these scares, these MRI scares, could actually, you know, reduce their pain level, increase their activity level by slow, sustained increase in activity. So I think, you know, that's that's a big issue. And I think, you know, this, this, this idea that, you know, drugs and um, clinical procedures which are often quite invasive and can often cause more harm because you know whatever people say is if you have a new knee you have at least you know a month or two of inactivity which actually can cause more harm than than good anyway i'm kind of gabbling on here but no this is important I, I guess, stuff though because you have a lot of different practitioners here and if you want a diagnosis i mean i've had friends it's like they've gone they've had a neck pain and they've gone to it and then oh no i need surgery this is bulging this is and it's like Look, I, it's certainly we're trying the other stuff first, isn't it? Before you yeah. carve into yourself yeah. <laughs> or take yeah. a drug that you're going to be on for the rest of your life. And this is what we talk about at Live Healthy a lot. Like, just why not? Why not give? We don't, everyone wants to rush for the thing that will fix the thing that's happening. And that speaks to the short term, you know, whether you're going to eat a pizza today or, or eat a salad and some chicken. But I just think it's worth it. It's worth it to take the time and it's worth it to say, stretch for 20 minutes and walk for 15 minutes and see how and do that for two weeks. So I love what you're doing, but yeah. I just want, let, let's just talk about Abu Dhabi 360, like how it, you know, you've been called here. What's sort of the front facing part of it? What's going on in the background that you can tell us? Well, I, mean, I think the, the front face is um, community events. It's about 
um, the app that we actually have just launched, and it's going through its kind of initial stages, and that will have those, you know, those inactive parts to it. Um, it's also about kind of campaigning as well. And it is about getting that kind of trusted information. So we're hoping that we kind of can work with you and organizations like you to get that kind of really important, you know, trusted information out there. But most importantly, we're hoping that we're, we're our work across government, um, and governments aren't really great at working across government, but I think, you know, there is a real kind of thirst and a need and also a potential in, in, in Abu Dhabi that, we, we do need to work together. So we, we are looking at how different parts of government can work effectively. So we're not going to have multiple apps. Uh, we're not going to have information that contradicts other information that other parts of other departments are giving. Um, when we are targeting specific segments of our population, we're going to make sure that you know, that information and the types of events are the right for that, um, for that, uh, for that particular segment. So we'll be working very much with um, the Family Foundation to target older people and families, um, be working um, with schools, departments um, and individual schools to try and increase the amount of statutory um, uh, physical activity that young people do, um, working with colleges again, and also working with the Department of Health. So they are working currently on a program to increase the numbers of what we call general practitioners. So people aren't automatically going when they have a kind of a problem with their knee, they don't actually go to a knee surgeon, they go to a general practitioner, and that general practitioner looks at the person as a whole. So sometimes a person with a knee may have a problem not because of the knee, maybe the gait that people have, have got, or it may be another issue associated with another part of their body. So it's it's about kind of thinking that through and also um, working across government means that we are, we, we, it's not about saving money. I mean, it is in a, in a way about saving kind of the population, but it's also making the resources that we've got in Abu Dhabi the most effective so that we're not duplicating um, and we are targeting in the most effective way so that, you know, people will know, right, when they go to a gym, you know, that's not right. I should not be asked to do that. Um, and I know that because I've got kind of trusted information and that's come through various parts of government. And when I go to government, um, and when I go to the website, it will all be providing that same information and same support. You mentioned something really interesting because I know when I moved here, I was shocked because I came from Canada and once there, I waited nine months for an MRI. I had a problem with my eye and here I had dislocated my shoulder right before I came here. And I thought, why don't I just phone? Up? I got an MRI for my shoulder. Like, and I got in to see an orthopedic guy, like, cause someone said, oh, you can just call and arrange all this stuff. I got it the next day, but yeah. this, you know, the, the model is so much different here. I don't know if there, you can you can just be dealing with a specialist and not even have a GP, which is the situation I'm in just because I lost my GP. <laughs> and that's, yeah. you know, that's so foreign in other parts of the world and it's not really effective, right? Your GP is supposed to pull it all together. You're not supposed yeah. to be able to phone and get no. an appointment with this yet. Were you, su were you surprised at that to see that? Um, well, it, it is very, I mean, if, if you, I mean, I work in various parts of the world. So it is normal um, in certain parts of the world to be able to do that. And, you know, effectively, you know, there are kind of arguments to say, well, if you've got something wrong with your shoulder, you should be able to go and see a shoulder specialist. But often that shoulder specialist <clears throat> will be a certain type of doctor. And, you know, a surgeon is a certain type of doctor. And they, they you know, they, they just think that you know, effectively, the best way to cure a problem is to go in there and sort it out. Whereas, you know, a kind of a medic, a general practitioner would kind of look at you, hopefully, holistically and say, well, actually, you know, that might, there may be another cause there. It may just be simply because you're sitting wrong. I mean, I'm looking at myself now. Yeah, um, I'm it's always aware that one, I should be moving. Um, I should never just sit 
just like that. And also, you know, there may be things that I'm doing, you know, shoes that I'm wearing. At the moment, I'm in Abu Dhabi in a, in a, in a, in a rented apartment. I know that bed is really bad for me and it's causing me a little bit of back pain. But it's knowing that I can't just run off to a specialist um, and him sort of then do an MRI and say, oh, there's some real problems there. I know there's problems there, but I still swim 40 lengths a day. And, you know, that's the thing is that all we have to be doing is making sure that people get the right advice, the right support, and the right opportunities. And we also need to think, you know, that it is difficult to exercise in Abu Dhabi in the summer. It is. You know, you, you know, when it's 50 degrees and, you know, that horrible humidity, who wants to go for a walk? But we've got to find them with all, find people with alternatives and also say to them, well, you may not be going to be as active in the summer as you are in the winter. But these are the things that you can do to at least stem that so that you're, you know, that you're, you're not feeling as inactive and you're still potentially, you know, still doing as much as you can within that, within the, within the, the fact that, you know, we know that it's difficult, it's difficult. And I think that's, that's it as well is that we can't say to people, you should be doing 30 minutes of rigorous activity every day. And, and, you know, people know that they, you can't do that. I can't do that. And I, I, I'm really trying to keep active. And also the five, you know, you should be eating five fruits and veg a day. Well, I know that as well. But yesterday there was nothing in my fridge and I had to go out. And the only thing that was available was a burger. And so I had a burger. I didn't feel guilty about it because I know today I'm going to think, right, okay, so I'm going to need to eat something more healthy. Yeah. So what will people see then moving forward? How will this start to in, uh, enter our lives and how can we engage with it? Well, I, I think you'll probably see less than you would probably think. So um, there will be lots of other parts of government that will be kind of working towards, you know, getting Abu Dhabi more active. So we're working with kind of you know, some of the planning authorities to make sure that any houses allow that ability to be able to walk to local shops or to the mosques or whatever. Um, but you'll see um, uh, potential for the kind of uh, for you to download the, the kind of the digital app. You'll also see quite a lot of programs that are developed by other parts of our organization, the Abu Dhabi Sports Council. So they'll be kind of rebranded as 360. And they'll also be kind of working towards that kind of tryouts because we that's our kind of work at the moment is that what we want people to do is to try new things. So, you know, we all like to, to kind of do what we know, but what we're trying to get people is to, to maybe just try a different type of exercise um, or try doing exercise in a different type of way. So there will be kind of campaigns around that, but we're not spending huge amounts of money on promotional stuff that's just going to get people to kind of, oh, right, I should be aware that I should be doing more, but I don't really know how to do it. So a lot of our promotional material will be very much direction. So it will be, if you are an older person, we have a program that's been set up in your local area, please go and go to that. So there's not going to be big widespread kind of uh, posters, adverts. It's going to be very, very subtle and direct, and it will be kind of signposting people to um, potential areas where they can actually, you know, do things. So I wouldn't like you to think that this is a kind of mass fitness program because it just we would just be wasting our money. It's very much directional, very much working across government, looking at kind of potential over this year, next year, five, 10 years time. So it's it's really about that. And anything that's done in this realm of trying to, you know, sort of nudge people towards this will be under that A3, A3, yeah. uh, Abu Dhabi 360 banner. When can we expect to see the app? Um, well, the app it has already been launched and it's um, available on uh, both the Apple and um the other one, which I've kind of forgotten, the, is it Android. the Apple Android? Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it, it is it, at the moment. It, it is very. It's much. It's kind of early stages. So we we are looking to, to kind of increase the kind of contents of that, 
Um, but it is, I would say it's quite interactive because it's, it does have quite a lot of learning in it. So it doesn't provide you with a kind of one size fits all, asks you a number of questions about your level of fitness, what you want to achieve, and then guides people through that rather than actually just saying, well, you know, well, you know, you're you're 25, so therefore you should be able to run a kind of a, a marathon or, you know, five miles. It asks those questions and gives you advice and support based on that that um, that information. Um, so it, it is more of kind of an interactive uh, app than than just a kind of you know activity app. Okay, and you'll be adding to it over time. I'll be downloading that after we get off the phone then, and I'll <laughs> put myself in a track. I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not in the slow lane, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I, I would say to anybody. Start with the slow lane. Okay. Um, we, we we haven't put the slow lane on yet, so we're currently developing that. Um, but you know, the slow lane does start with kind of structures. And uh, I mean, to be honest, I do quite a lot of the the kind of the five minutes warm up, ten minutes um, of kind of rigorous exercise, and then five minutes because you know that to me, although it's in that kind of slow lane. That's sometimes how I feel in the morning. So, you know, what's the point in really putting yourself, making you feel worse than you actually need to? So I think there's there's quite a lot in there where people would actually say, well, actually, I'm quite happy to be in the slow lane for a little yeah. while or go back to the slow lane in summer because, you know, I know that I'm not as active as I was. So therefore, I need to kind of you know think about what, what work I do. Well, it's interesting because we've been hearing, you know, the trends lately um, for 2023 are, you know, weights, less hardcore exercise. I mean, we're hearing this all over. And just me personally, I'm sort of struggling to see the difference between when I do weights and walking and when I was hitting the spin classes and the the CrossFit classes. I'm trying, I, I'm I mean, I'm sure hardcore people would say yes in your muscle mass and your tone, but I don't know. I'm I'm it's not a huge difference. No, no, and I think I think I mean I, I mean having kind of worked in this area, I mean not potentially. I mean I've worked in all areas of behaviour change, so it's about smoking cessation, about reducing kind of prescription drugs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but in terms of kind of activity, it is I think a kind of combination of all different types of exercise. That if you can do that, you can do a combination of 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 kind of you know quite hard of gym work and then kind of walking and then you know making sure that you are um taking kind of the right exercise for kind of how you're feeling as well and it is really about you know doing things that you like um and you will continue to do things that you like you will stop doing things that you um, that you're not so uh, yeah. um, Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to finding out more about this and engaging and working with you guys. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And we're, we're also kind of looking forward to, you know, now that I've seen what you do and your website and also talking with you. I mean, I think we're really looking forward to working with you as well, because I think the more information that we can put out, which is, you know, supportive and engaging and also, you know, working with people who are really interested in, in, and not the kind of, you know, those kind of quick fixes. Um, that's really what we're interested in. So we're really looking forward to working with you as well. Amazing. Okay, well, lovely speaking with you. Yes. Bye. 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 That's it for this week. If you liked the podcast, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. We'll see you next time on the Live Healthy Podcast.